Okay, um, good evening and um, welcome everyone to PNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. We're delighted to have with us athlete turned activist, Etan Thomas, here to talk about his new book, Police Brutality and White Supremacy, The Fight Against American Traditions. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first though, to post a question at any point during this evening's discussion, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of Police Brutality and White Supremacy. Uh, Etan, who played in the NBA throughout the 2000s, is not only an accomplished athlete, but also a published poet, freelance writer, and motivational speaker. He calls himself the personification of the activist athlete, which is a very apt description, because even as a player, he was advocating for social justice. His first book, released in 2005, was a collection of poems called More Than an Athlete. After retiring from professional basketball, he wrote the autobiography Fatherhood, Rising to the Ultimate Challenge, which examined his own fatherless childhood and the importance of fatherhood. Next, he released Voices of the Future, a collection of poems and essays from young writers, and several years ago, he came out with We Matter, Athletes and Activism, a collection of interviews on the intersection of race and politics in sports. When he's not composing books, he's working as a senior writer for basketballnews.com, and he can be seen on MSNBC as a special correspondent. He also co-hosts a weekly show with Dave Zirin called The Collision, where sports and politics collide. In his new book, uh, Etan takes the same approach as he did in We Matter, offering interviews with a range of individuals, prominent figures in sports, the media, education, and religion, police officers, family members of black men killed or br brutalized by police. This time, uh, he talks to them exploring issues of police violence, white supremacy, and the struggle for racial justice in America. Each of the 11 chapters opens with personal commentary from Etan, followed by transcripts of his conversations. Kirkus Review called the book a relevant collection of Q's and A's and Library Journal said Etan's interviews demand careful reading. The conversation with Etan will be Yamiche Alcindor, uh, who I'm sure is familiar to many of you as White House correspondent for the PBS uh, NewsHour and moderator of Washington Week. She's also a political contributor for NBC News and MSNBC. Yamish often tells stories about the intersection of race and policies, uh, race and politics, as well as fatal police encounters. So she's perfect moderator uh, for Etan this evening. Uh, Etan and Yamish, the screen is yours. Thanks so much for that introduction. It is um, very exciting to, to come to you today. Um, I know that we're obviously still living in this remote world um, where we're not able to gather in person, but I'm sure that this is going to be a robust conversation. So, Etan, thank you so much for, for having this conversation with me. No, I, I really appreciate you um, taking time out. I know you have a busy schedule. Um, I appreciate you even doing the interview with me uh, for the book and for everything that you do. I, I really do mean that. I have a lot of respect for you and everything that you stand for um, and the principles that you stand for and that what you bring to um, you know, your writings and everything like that. So much respect to you. Well, I appreciate that. And I should tell you, my husband wishes he was doing this interview because he's a huge basketball fan. And he was like, who are you talking to tonight? But that's, <laughs> we'll save that for another time. Um, right. I'm going to open up by asking you a question that I ask a lot of people when I talk to them about their books. Why did you want to write this book at this time? You know, it's interesting because, you know, that, that's a question that a lot of people have been asking me as I've been doing these interviews. Um, and they, they, they ask me this and there's so much going on. Um, you know, when I did We Matter, Athletes and Activism, it was really about encouraging athletes to use their voices and their platforms. So I talked to athletes, you know, of yesteryear, like Bill Russell and, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and, you know, encouraged athletes now to keep using their voices the way the athletes in the past did. Um, and I interviewed a few family members of victims of police brutality. Um, Emerald Gardner, who was Eric Gardner's daughter, um, Tiffany Crutcher, who was Terrence Crutcher's uh, sister, um, you know, Javaris Bolton, who's Trayvon Martin's brother, and uh, Valerie Castile, 
who is um, Orlando Castile's mother. So since then, I started doing a lot of work with them, with their foundations, with things that they're trying to push for. And I wanted to delve a little bit deeper with this book um, into the, the issue of police brutality. You know, I mean, it's one thing to, to speak out about it, to raise awareness, but now it's like, what are tangible solutions? And I just wanted to dig deeper, talk about the history of it, you know, talk to different policemen um, about the things that could be done um, and that should be done in order to fix this issue of the way that we police in this country. So that's, that's the real reason why I wanted to really, you know, take on this, this task of writing this book. Mm. Um, and talk to me a little bit about how you decided who you wanted to talk to and sort of why interviewing people was the way to really sort of bring this book alive. Well, I, I think that that interviewing different people and having different voices, um, you know, lends to a larger conversation about it. Um, so each chapter is broken down to a to a different topic. Um, so the first one I'm dealing with Rodney King, and that was you know, what really introduced me um, at a young age in middle school uh, to police brutality. So I talked about it there. I talked to Rodney King's daughter. You know, I talked to, you know, Craig Hodges, who was, you know, playing for the Bulls at that time. And, you know, why he was trying to get, you know, Michael Jordan and, and Magic to, to, to make a statement at that time. And everything that was going on, you know, at that time. And, and you know, just break down um, you know, what we were seeing, because it, it's, it's, it's totally different because right now, you know, young people could just look at their phones anytime they want to and see a different case. But back then, you know, that was really, it, it was really rare that you saw something like that on TV, you know, the video of it and, you know, the beating. And then I remember the, the um, not guilty verdicts and how that affected everything. So I did that with each chapter, with each topic. Um, so bring other people into the conversation. You know, it just makes for an actual conversation from different perspectives. And did you have, I know when I'm reporting stories, I sort of have this wish list that I start off with, like, here are the people that I really want to talk to. Here are the people that I might end up talking to. So take me a little bit through one more, one, one more kind of process question for you. Take me through sort of how you decided who you were going to talk to and how you decided to sort of focus on the Rodney King and the Central Park Five and George Floyd, sort of how those voices came together. Well, it's interesting because, you know, with, with the Central Park Five, you know, I wanted to reach out to one of the members of the Central Park Five, and we were actually following each other on Instagram, just to seeing different things that I posted and, you know, encouraging them and stuff. So I just asked him and he said, yeah, sure, that's Raymond Santana. And he said, I would love to do the interview. And that's really how it happened, you know? I mean, after, after, after that, you know, with different chapters, I remember seeing a lot of times people ask me, well, how did you how, is, how did CNN's Jake Tapper get involved in this? And I tell them, well, I was watching, you know, January 6th and I, I saw him calling out different media and different, you know, for, for their role and kind of pushing the lie, what he talked about. And, and, the, and he was calling out that different media wasn't calling it what it was, which was domestic terrorism and things of that nature. I said, okay, that's interesting. I haven't really heard too many media people call out other media people like that. So I reached out to him. And he said, yeah, sure, I would love to. So that was really how they kind of came about. Different people just fit in perfectly to the chapters. And that's, that's, that's how, it, how it came about. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you also talk about children a lot in this book. You talk a lot about your childhood in this book. Talk a little bit about the, the relevance of that. So I, I bring a lot of my personal um, life into it because it's really personal for me. Um, you know, I, I would go on different interviews and we would talk about police brutality and talk about a specific case and things of that nature. And I would talk about my interactions with my children and how it would affect them and the questions that they would ask. And, you know, I would tell them about the talk that Black families have to have with our children every single time something like this happens. And, you know, it's something that it was, it's, it's kind of foreign to white people because it's not their world. Like they don't have to think about that the way that black families do. That's just the reality of it. So uh, in talking about that, people were always so amazed at the conversation that I was having at my with my children at such a young age, um, you know, because my kids are young. And that's the part where, you know, it's personal for me. It's personal for us. Um, these cases aren't just cases where, you know, we're talking about a topic or trying to pontificate on, on, a, on an issue or anything like that, but these are very personal to us because we have to look our children in the eye and explain to them why the rules are different for them. You know, why when you, when you get stopped by the police, you can't make any sudden movements. You can't, you know, those are the talks that we have to have. So, you know, bringing that personal um, part into the book, um, you know, I didn't really know any other way to, to start each chapter, but, but 
but showing the reason why, you know, it is so personal to me. Mm. Um, and I want to talk about black women. When you talk about sort of how personal you are, I should say, I really appreciate when you're always talking about baby Sierra, I like one day mm-hmm. I imagine meeting her and she's going to be taller than me and not a baby. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, you talk about black women in this book. You, you obviously are, love black women or raising a black woman, um, black mm-hmm. women. Talk a little bit about sort of the decision to do that. You interviewed me, you interviewed uh, a former police officer and, and sort of the role in, in that you wanted black women to play in having their own chapter here. You know, well, interesting, you know, I also interviewed uh, Chakisha Clements, who was um, beaten at a, at a Waffle House. And um, I interviewed her for that chapter as well. And I wanted to show, you know, a lot of times Black women are left out of this conversation with police brutality. That's just the way that it is sometimes. And, you know, I showed that interview when I interviewed Chakisha Clements to my daughter, Imani. And she's watching and she's asking all these questions. She's like, well, wait a minute, why, why did this happen? Why is this you know, this way, you know, why, you know, then she started doing some research. Then she started looking up and she wrote a paper, you know, we, we homeschool, so you could do a little extra when you homeschool. So I had her write a whole research paper about it. Um, and the things that she saw, she was very upset by, um, you know, as far as the percentages of, of convictions, the percentages of, you know, um, cases that, that involve black women that even get any media attention at all. Um, so, so really being able to interview you for this chapter and you know Captain Pruitt, um, and talking about that differences and how much she appreciated. And I, I just got to say for you, um, she really appreciated your chapter and your discussion of always bringing that uh, to what you do. And the part where I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you said that there might be, you know, you have a White House, um, you know, a briefing to do, and you're supposed to ask, you know, Trump about this and that. But really, you have in the back of your mind um, and on your heart this situation that you just read about that just happened and how much it's weighing on you and like emotionally, the emotional toll that it takes on you and you have to write about it. You have to be the voice for them. And she really was like, oh, that's amazing that she uses her position that way to be that voice for us. That's what that's what my daughter said. So it's just really important, um, you know, she told me to, to tell you, you know, like that she can't thank you enough for being that voice because we need those voices. So that's a long-winded way of of explaining why it's so important to me to include, um, in particular, Black women in this conversation. Um, You know, I have, I have, I have daughters. You know, I have my wife. You know, and I we have discussions. So those are the same discussions that that are are included. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I definitely appreciate Imani saying that and and sending that message to me. I mean, so many times we talk about police brutality when we talk about Black Lives Matter. A lot of the conversation is about men because, uh, frankly, the numbers are so so much sort of focused on that. But then when you when you actually look at the research and you look at sort of how Black women can be criminalized and Sandra Bland and all of these cases, you realize that they are a central part of this. I'm thinking also about a great New York Times story by my friend Erica. Um, uh, she's an education reporter at the New York Times, and she did this, this whole study about about how young black women are criminalized and um, and and face harsh de- face harsh discrimination um, and and harsh discipline in schools. You know, there's a lot mm-hmm. of conversation about yes. sort of how young black boys are, are criminalized and sort of how they're treated in school. But she did this really amazing story about the fact that black women are basically number two on that, right? Like after right. they they focus on black men, it's it's black women. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of that aspect of of your thinking and how personal this was for you. Oh, definitely. You know, I remember when I was putting this together, there was a case, and I don't remember the young girl's name, but she was in Rochester, New York. Um, and she had to be like baby Sierra's age. She was like nine or 10 years old. And they had her handcuffed and she's like crying for her daddy. It's this terrible, terrible scene. And it's just like, you know, I remember baby Sierra asking me, would they do that to a white girl? Like, that was her question to me. Like, would they do, do you think that they would do that to a white girl? And what crimes she could she have possibly committed that, that needed all of that? And, you know, her crime was, you know, I guess in class, she wouldn't stop talking or something like that. They were saying that she was unruly or and then they called the police. And, it, and it's just, it's amazing to me, you know, that you would, it, it's our, our children, the cuteness stage goes away very early with black children. Mm. Um, and I remember this. So my son, you know, was, was my firstborn. I remember having this conversation a lot in We Matter with my son because, you know, he's tall for his age and. You know, I'm having the talk with him and I'm thinking, okay, you know, right now he's looked at as the cute little kid with locks like his daddy and stuff like that. But soon it's not going to look that like that. That's going to be a little bit different. And, you know, I have to tell him what to do. You know, you go to a store, 
always get a receipt so they can't accuse you of stealing if you, you know, stuff like that. And so with my daughters, I'm having the same type of conversation. So we were just watching, um, you know, for, for MLK weekend, we had, they had seen Selma and they know all of, you know, all of that. We've talked about Dr. King uh, over the years. So, so we, we sat down and we watched uh, The Hate You Give. So you remember, um, you remember at the beginning, if anybody saw the movie, where he's breaking down all the different things that you don't, that you do when you're stopped by the police. So when, when the little girl's in the car and she's stopped by the police, they're literally yelling at the screen like, no, 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 don't make any movements. No, 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 don't reach back into your car. No, you have to keep your, that my daughters are yelling that on the movie because they've heard us have that conversation. You know what I mean? And it's like, they know what's going to happen and they know that they can't do that. And it's unfortunate but those are the talks that we have to have with our children. So, you know, that that part, it's always interesting to hear a lot of mainstream America's reaction to that, because again, that's not their world. They don't have to worry about that, but it's, it's, it's definitely our world and every black family can relate to that. It's certainly something that every black family can relate to, whether you're a boy or a girl, especially mm -hmm. I have an older brother who's about six feet tall. Frankly, he's darker than me. My mother worried more about him than me. He's been stopped by the police so many times, stopped by jogging. I mean, there's so many stories that, um, but, you know, but for, but for the grace of God, go, go I, right? Right, um, right? But then she also had to worry about me because she was like, yeah, but you will also sort of be, you can maybe be a little opinionated. Maybe you can, mm -hmm. you can maybe say some stuff that you're not supposed Supposed to maybe people will look at you and your, and your five two frame and think okay you're a threat, but also at some point you might also be seen as someone who is problematic and or you're just maybe playing you know a video game with your with your nephew um, as we've seen in, in other cases where black women have been shot just for being in their homes. So you know there's all sorts of things right. that have happened. But I want to talk a little bit more about your sort of childhood. You you write about Rodney King. You write about Central Park Five. Mm -hmm. These are things that happened while you were growing up. Talk a bit mm -hmm. about how those things impacted your youth and impacted who you became. Well, one of the stories that I tell in the book is about when I was um, in Harlem. You know, I, I, was, I was born in Harlem, but I moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma when I was young. But I spent all my summers in Harlem. And so I was actually there when everything happened with the Central Park Five. I remember it. It was 1989. Um, and I was, I was, I remember the uh, Public Enemy song came out, Fight the Power. I remember, you know, and my, my grandfather would take me to the court, you know, to play against the older guys. You know, I was, I was tall for my age, you know, but I needed, you know, you got to play against the older guys, get roughed up on the court. That's, that's part of it, right? So I remember actually seeing, and I tell the story in the book, of all the police coming there. And so, so let me back up. When, when, when the Central Park Five happened, the police were going to different playgrounds, to basketball courts all these places in Harlem and just rounding up black and brown kids, teenagers. Mm. That's what they do. Now I was young, but I was tall. So I looked like I was a teenager, you know? And I remember my, you know, going back to the apartment and my grandmother watching the, the TV and seeing Donald Trump saying that, you know, that they, he wanted the kids to have the death penalty. And she was, I remember her being upset and, and like, you know, he's, putting a bullseye on every, you know, black and, and, and Puerto Rican kid. That's what she said, black and Puerto Rican kid in the neighborhood. And I remember all of that vividly. So when I'm talking to Raymond Santana and he's telling me different things, it's like I'm having flashbacks while he's, while I'm interviewing him. Cause I remember the different things. And it's, it's you know, it's amazing because I, you know, when I, I watched When They See Us with my children and I'm having flashbacks as well. Cause I, I remember when this happened I remember when that happened. I remember everybody, you know, the the the, the chatter, and it, it it was something that I wanted to go back to in order to be able to highlight um, more of the talk with young people. And I had an officer in, in that in that chapter as well, and he's telling young people everything that the Central Park Five did wrong in the situation, like never talk to the police without your parents ever. He, did, he said it like 10 times, never, ever, ever, you know what I mean? Talk to the police without your parents. And when they're in the interrogation room, people don't understand that happens all the time. Like literally all the time. Like they, you know, they use all the interrogation techniques, all the stuff you see on TV, on Law and Order and all that different stuff, but they're using them against little young kids. And it's, it's, it's terrible. But highlighting that is, you know, it's, it's tough. So it was, it was a tough chapter to be able to, to but I, I was so honored that Raymond Santana, you know, went back through everything and talked to me about it in the chapter. 
you know, and he was really vivid in his description. So, you know, that was that was a, that was a powerful chapter. Yeah, it was. I mean, it is a powerful chapter. It's, and it's also powerful that you have flashbacks to sort of seeing that in real time. Um, I just want to remind people we are about, we have about 20 more minutes of me um, asking questions. But if people have questions, please put it in the Q&A. And if you have put it in the chat section, if you can try to move your question over to the Q&A, we're going to try to get to as many of them as possible. So just a reminder, if you're liking what we're saying, what we're hearing, or you have follow up questions that you want ease on to answer, please, please do that. Um, I want to talk about your conversation that you've had with police officers. Um, you just talked so vividly about sort of seeing policing in action as a, as a child, really. I wonder what you take away from your conversations about policing. I know I've talked to a lot of police officers, police unions. Um, it's maybe in some ways balance my reporting. I don't know if you know, I think balance the, my reporting is, is a good way to put it because I think that there are all these things that police officers do wrong, but there are also all of these people who go into policing because they want to help their communities. So I wonder what you take take away from the conversation that you've had with police officers. Oh, I think that they were great. I mean, you know, the since since you know going back to We Matter, I started doing a lot of panel discussions and you know um, different things like that with with police officers. There, we did things involving um, police departments. Um, and things of that nature. And, and so listening to them, um, you know, they recognize that there is a problem with the way that we police. I mean, it's not like it's, you know, it's not like a us against them. A lot of times when you write a book like this, the first thing that you'll hear people, oh, were you anti-police? Like, no, it has nothing to do with anti-police. It's, it's anti-police brutality, which everybody should be against, but no, it, and it's trying to find tangible solutions. So the, the, the police officers gave different things and they were they were, they were great solutions, honestly. They were great things that could be implemented. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting because there's a lot of things that we get lost in the phrasing of, you know, things become political. You know, so for instance, one topic, um, police, police departments all across the country will agree that they wear too many hats, that they have too much responsibility. You know, I saw somebody, you know, in the chat say, well, are police trained to be able to handle um, going into, you know, um, being able to deal with children and, and have being resource officers? And the answer is no, they're not. You know what I mean? So the question is, why are they there? Very good question. Should they be the ones to be there um, in, with children? Should they be the ones to be called when there's a nonviolent, um, you know, call that has to do with mental health or a wellness check? So, you know, the interviewing different people who have who have been whose family members have been victims of when their loved one was called for when the police was called for a wellness check and it turned lethal you know when the police came because the police are trained one way so if you're only trained to look at every, to you know to deal with everything with a hammer everything's going to look like a nail some things don't need a hammer. That's the way that that's that's the honest truth. So when you talked about the the people who you know the 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 the, the young women who the young girls and schools who they're having they're getting a um, um, this strong reaction from police officers. They're not trained to handle certain situations to deal with little teenage girls. Sometimes a teenage girl you tell them something and they might suck their teeth and roll their eyes. That doesn't mean you have to tackle them. That doesn't mean you have to handcuff them and hog tie them. They roll their eyes like teenagers do, but you're not trained to even be able to interact with the teenage girl. Do you know what I mean? So why are you even there in the first place? So, but but what 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 becomes the issue though, and you'll see as we're talking is they you, they're agreeing, but then it comes to okay, so if there's another entity that is more equipped to handle mental health calls, then shouldn't they get the funding for that call and you know for that department? And they be the ones to call in that situation. That's when you get, well, there's a difference in, in budgeting. And that's when you get to defund the police. And so it's like, okay, they, they're with you. But then there's a stigma with that, that phrase, defund the police. And then it stops there. It's like, okay, then you have to go back to, okay, what is defund the police? Defund is not the same as abolish. Defund is not the same as get it rid of. It means, you know, adjusting budgets, which happen all the time. But it, that becomes the politicized part where, you know, there's like this stalemate because you can't, can't, you can't get past this part. And that's the, that's the frustrating part because police departments will, will agree that they're wearing too many hats. But now it's like, okay, now that we know that you're wearing too many hats, what can be done to alleviate that issue? 
So it's a little bit of a, a frustrating, you know, tug of war. But, um, you know, that's 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 part of the process. That's part of what we're fighting for. For sure. I, my mother was a social worker for three decades. And there are mm -hmm. so many things that social workers and clinicians and counselors are trained in that, frankly, police officers at times cannot handle. And that's that's based on my conversations with police officers who say we are not here and not trained in the same way to handle right. people that are having mental health breakdowns. And there is right. this real uh, stigmatization of defund the police because there are some who use that phrase and, and mean abolish the police. And there are some who use that phrase and mean, actually, we just want to take away money from the police. That, that maybe take away the money for the tanks or for some of the military equipment and use it toward beefing up maybe housing or, or, be, or beefing up counselors. But because there's all this nuance, it really is hard to sort of have this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And with that sort of conversation, having this conversation, um, that brings me in some ways to sort of the conversation across race. Um, allyship and, and white people have always been part of the civil rights movement. When you look back at, at Selma, when you look back at sort of Martin Luther King's work, um, you interviewed some people like Sue Bird, like Rex Chapman, I wonder if you could just talk a bit about sort of what you learned and what your conversations um, taught you about white privilege, but also about sort of having uncomfortable conversations um, and what that was like for you. So it was interesting. So I had a, a chapter called White Privilege and I only interviewed white people for this chapter. Um, and I did that intentionally because, you know, to be honest, there's a segment of the population that will only be able to hear it from another white person with this topic. That's just the way that it is. It could be, you know, any person and their their ears automatically close up if they hear, you know, me or you, somebody that looks like us, talking about white privilege. So I said, okay, let's let them talk about white privilege. So Sue Bird is talking about it, and everybody loves Sue Bird. You know what I mean? And and they all mentioned during this the conversation where you know they're like, we're 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 saying this, but this isn't something that hasn't been said before. You know, I mean, there is, I mean, Sue Bird was talking about how, um, you know, whenever white people hear, some white people hear the term white privilege, they take offense and they say, well, I didn't grow up with money. It's like, well, that doesn't have anything to do with money. They're like, well, you know, I had, I worked hard for what, for what I, for what I was able to achieve. And this is Sue Bird talking. She's like, well, ain't nobody saying you didn't work hard. You know, we're saying that certain things didn't happen to you because you were black, like it happens to black people. That's white privilege. And it's the privilege for you not to know that world um, because of the color of your skin. And for them breaking it down, I mean, it was really, it was really an interesting chapter. I mean, um, like you mentioned, Rex Chapman um, talking about it, um, you know, and he was he was saying how he he's, you know, he's in Kentucky. He he grew up in Kentucky, and Kentucky is, you know, it's Kentucky. So he's looking around and he's seeing different things happen, and he's using his platform and saying, wait a minute, this isn't right. Like, why are y'all doing this? You know, and, and it's, it's, there are certain things that white people can say, like you hear Greg Popovich, you hear, you know, Steve Kerr just talk about in the NBA in the realm that is just accepted differently um, coming from them. That's just the, that's just the reality of it. And so talking about what they can do to be an ally, to be an actual ally, not somebody just says, okay, we stand with you. You know what I mean? Or we're not racist. Um, you know, that's what Brianna, Brianna uh, Stewart kept saying. It's not enough just to say you're not racist. You have to be like actively against racism. And she was quoting Angela Davis. And she said that's like her mantra that she's taken on that, you know, it's not enough because it's, it's a matter of empathy. Seeing that although this doesn't directly affect me, it's wrong that it affects anybody. Yeah. And, and that's the part that's difficult to create but hearing them say it and express it um, is going to resonate with a lot of people. I also think when you think about the word privilege and you think about sort of, I've, I've spent a lot of time sort of thinking about um, white privilege, but also just thinking about masculinity and thinking about mm. economics. There's a privilege that sort of all of us have that's different, of course, from white privilege, which is sort of historical and ingrained and, and sort of just based on the 1619 and sort of how Black folks got to America in the first place. But I think when you talk about the issue of privilege, um, there's this, I think this, this idea that you can teach people about privilege just by having them look at their own lives. So I have interviewed so many, I think, white folks in particular in Pennsylvania and in rough areas of the country in West Virginia 
who are thinking to themselves, I don't have anything. My father didn't have anything. I'm struggling. And I'm looking up at, at other people that have more money than me, that have more privilege than me, who have more, in their minds, more privilege than me. How in the world am I considered privileged? And I think that in some ways, I wonder what you would say to, to, to some of those folks. And also what you would say, the idea that like everyone should be looking at their privilege. I remember when I moved to New York, I could pay and I could afford the prices for these apartment buildings that firefighters and teachers couldn't afford. And I instantly understood that I had this privilege and I was unfortunately part of the gentrification of this of this community was that I was living in Crown Heights, even though I was a black woman, even though I was Haitian, I had to understand that like, yeah, the reason why these apartments are being made are for people like me to move into. So I wonder mm -hmm. so, sort of what you think, take away from that. I think again, white privilege is a completely different, it's a completely different subset because it, it is so much about race and about sort right. of institutions. So I'm not saying that they're the same at all, but mm -hmm. I wonder what you make of sort of, of, of that conversation on privilege. And I, and I, and I, and I get that question a lot. Um, you know, I, I actually, one person who was a Syracuse fan, you know, I was just going back and forth with him on Twitter. He was like, well, you had privilege as an athlete um, that you got to be able to, you know, do this and, and, and do that as an, as an athlete. I was like, yeah, but you know, I, I, I did all that as an athlete, but you didn't ever have a situation where, you know, you're driving, you know, down Comstock or some of these, these streets in Syracuse and you're, you know, stopped by the police and you're made to get out the car on the snow because they don't they don't believe that you own your car. Like I've had that when I was in Syracuse. I was like, you didn't have but you didn't have to deal with that because, you know, there's a lot of people who look like me that had to deal that with that while they're at Syracuse. You know, so so me being an athlete didn't save me from being black. And that's the, that's the part, you know, it's interesting. I, I interviewed Tim Wise um, and he talks about this a, a, a lot. And one of the things that he pointed out was the, the reason when he's, when you're going back and saying, um, and I'm paraphrasing of course, but, but when he's saying, how can we illuminate the, the, the privilege with white people to make it plain for them? And, and he's saying, well, we have to go all the way back to the beginning of when you're, they're first educated. So he said, okay, so imagine this starts back in kindergarten. He's like, so imagine you being told that there's a whole country here with people living on it and a whole civilization, but it's not even worth being even recognized as being discovered until your people come. He was like, so if you're told that, you're told that you're superior to everybody else. He's like, and, and, and also, what does that tell other people that they're inferior? He's like, but that's where it starts. So that he's like, he says, so white people have been educated from that point on that they are superior. So it's not like it's a quick fix. And I was just like, wow. Like when he said that, I was like, no, you're, you're right. You know what I mean? We, we have to be taught about our history at home. There were, yeah, you know, exactly. I feel like people have to be talking about their history. And we also, I think, maybe I think about myself. I think mm -hmm. when I think about sort of my privilege, I also have to think, well, what are my talents going to be for? I became a reporter because of Emmett Till and the story of Emmett Till and what civil rights reporters were. So it's like, okay, I have the privilege to question presidents. I think I recognize mm -hmm. that as a privilege. And mm -hmm. I think that that means what are you going to do with that privilege, right? It's it's not only that you were an athlete who maybe had economics and also fame and maybe stature that others didn't, but it's also, okay, so if I, ha if I can recognize, yes, I had that, what am I actually doing with it? Mm -hmm. And, and that's the thing about having the privilege to be able to reach out to different people to be able to construct a book like this. You know, I could reach out to someone and say, hey, you know what I mean? I want to write on this topic. Would you, yeah. you know, lend your voice to it? And, and they can say, oh, no, we would love, I would love to. I, I watched you play it with the Wizards. I watched you, I would love to do that. And then they actually do it. So, yes, that definitely is a privilege. And that's definitely using your, your position and your platform to be able to, to you know, elevate and fight for something else. And, and the reason why is dealing with all the different family members that I've even, you know, extended even more so in this book and seeing how sometimes they're feeling like they have nobody fighting for them. You know, after after the attention goes away, you know, initially and all the all their 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 loved one is trending and everybody's following it, then after a while and they all tell the same thing, all that goes away and they're just left there. You yeah. know what I mean? Trying to put the pieces together. Yeah. And they're trying to fight for laws to be changed in their particular city. So that what happened to their loved one doesn't keep happening. Yeah. And it gets me goosebumps when you mention that, because to me, that is the story that we have to continue to tell over and over and over again in every single medium. I remember when Philando Castile died mm -hmm. um, and, and was and was shot by the police officer. And that was that little girl in the backseat, his girlfriend's mm -hmm. daughter, consoling yeah. her mother. I remember being wrecked, like crying right. the entire train ride 
from yeah. my my apartment in Brooklyn to the New York Times and getting there and being like, I can't write about Bernie Sanders, which is what I was covering that day. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write about children. And I ended up going to talk to some of the same people that you talked to, but also talking to Oscar Grant's daughter um, and talking to the grandchildren of of um, Eric Garner and talking to mm -hmm. the sister of, of, to, of Tamir Rice and talking to all these mm -hmm. people about sort of the generational trauma that comes with that and all the children who are terrified of the police um, and whose loved ones aren't there because of that. So I think it's, it's such important work um, to do that. I also want to remind people, we have about five more minutes of me questioning him. Um, I, there are some good questions coming into the Q and a, um, Eton already answered one of them, which was kind of breaking the rules, but it's fun. I'm gonna let you do that. Um, mm -hmm. but if, you, if there are other people that have questions, please, please, please put it in the Q and a section. We'll get to them in about five minutes. Um, so you have a section on this book about um, white evangelicals, about about religion, about sort of history of mm -hmm. of Christianity. Talk a bit about that, that and the conversations that were most illuminating to you. Um, so so those, that, that was a deep chapter. You know, I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, and that was you know hard in the Bible Belt, um, white evangelicals, and they're an inter interesting bunch. I'll say I'll say that. And and you know when I saw the the you know the Trump supporters, and on one hand, you know they're 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 the party of values. And then I see everything that Trump was stood for and what he was about, it didn't match. And so I'm talking to Steph Curry about that, you know, cause he's a devout Christian. I'm like, well, how did that, and he, and he said, that's why I couldn't support Trump. How can I support him? And he's exactly the opposite of everything that I believe in. Like he said, he's not even trying. Like he's not even trying to, you know, um, be Christ-like. Everybody falls and everybody falls short, but he's not even trying. And so it's, going back even further uh, about how Christianity was used to justify and implement slavery. And so I talked to Bishop Talbot Swan about that. Everybody knows Bishop Talbot Swan. He, he doesn't hold back at all. And uh, Chris Broussard. So I talked to specific Christians about this and the way that Christianity has been used and weaponized. Um, and people can weaponize anything. And it's just the difference of, you know, you know, it, it, it's so much involved in it because when you're going back to the slavery to slavery times and you know they're breaking it down the, the changing to how Jesus looked the reason why he you know changed to look a certain way the reason why all the angels were look, shown a certain way the why that because it was like we who are the slave masters are of the same people of Jesus and you are the, you know just making that whole connection of the way that it was used and how that was the opposite of the actual teachings of Jesus Christ. You know, and, and it's just, it's, it was something where, you know, when you're, when you're looking at the history and the, the tradition of, of racism and tradition of white supremacy, you, that's one of the parts that you have to look at is the way that, you know, Christianity was used in order to, you know, push that narrative and implement that. Mm, mm. Um, one other, I mean, in some ways it's, it's connected with this because there were a lot of people um, who, see who especially a lot of white evangelicals who went on january 6th who became insurrectionists who broke into mm -hmm. the capitol um mm -hmm. but there are also of course veterans and business people and all sorts of folks that showed mm -hmm. up to break into the capitol and try to bring american democracy to its knees um talk a little bit about sort of how you experienced january 6th but also how you write about it in this book um how it informed the way that, that you that you focus on that well, it was interesting, you know, first I interviewed Jamel Hill and she made the comparisons of how, you know, this would have looked a lot differently if it was black people, you know, storming the Capitol. And she was like, could you imagine if we, she's like, we couldn't even have the thought bubble to even plan something like this. Like it wouldn't have ever gotten past, you know, it, 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 it is, it's a mirror of white privilege because well, can we I just couldn't say even... I could just, I don't mean to interrupt you, but Look, I was on the lawn of the White House when that was happening and I could not not say that. I had to say that on PBS Live on TV and say, if these people were black, they would oh. literally be getting shot because I've oh, covered no Black Lives yeah. Matter protests where grandmothers and their mm -hmm. children were arrested mm -hmm. for peacefully walking around. Yeah. And I cannot even imagine what that would yeah. look like. And I think that we should probably just say that and, and leave room for that because I think it's so plainly obvious. It's the thing that we don't get to talk about that much about because there's so mm -hmm. many other things to talk about because people are getting you know charged and arrested every day, but it's still mm -hmm. this sort of mind boggling thing that, that, that the people who, who broke into the Capitol, they had this sort of sense of privilege, this sort mm -hmm. of sense that they could do this and live to talk about it. Mm -hmm. One of the things Jamel said is like, they didn't even cover their faces. They didn't have masks on. They didn't even have, they, they went in there proudly. They were filming it and putting it on their social media 
while they're like going into different senators and different politicians rooms and messing them up and defecating on the walls and taking pictures with their like we couldn't like she's like that wouldn't even be a thought of, of a possibility of something that we could do and live to tell about it and that was just the the you know the stark difference but you know breaking down that that you know that in that chapter um jake tapper was really talking about the people who helped usher that in and that's the biggest thing that he had the issue with the different politicians the people in the media the people who you know drummed up and said yes the election was stolen from us and we need to do something at all and he was like none of these people are being held accountable they all they all need to be held accountable they were all part of it and i i, I was agreeing 100 i was like no you're right and even in the even in the sentences that we're seeing we're seeing people get arrested we're like that little bit of time that you're getting for for what you did like we have people that we know that are you know got 25 you know what i mean with an l for a little teaspoon of weed that's their second or third offense but it's a, but it's literally possession now you stormed the u.s capitol and you're getting mutts some people getting probation some people getting we're like yeah that's it's it's a big difference it's two different americas and that's just you know a, a, that illuminated that for the entire world to see for sure, for sure. Well, I will stop asking my questions. I have one last question for you, but I'll put it all the way at the end. I'm gonna start asking some audience questions. Okay. The first question I have is, which interview in the book, and this is from an anonymous attendee, um, which okay. interview in the book was the hardest to get and how did you go about getting it? Ooh. Great question. Hardest, yeah, that is a good question. You know, it's interesting because the end the, the I, would, I thought that they would be hard to get. That's the same thing with We Matter. Like, I was like, well, they're not going to want to do an interview with me. And I would ask them and they would, I mean, even when I reached out to you, I was like, she got way more stuff to be worried about. I mean, she's interviewing Trump. She's challenging him. She, but when I reached out, you hit me like right back. Like, oh no, I'd love to. That, so that was kind of like how it happened. And it was, I mean, it was really a blessing that, that so many people wanted to lend their voice to this topic. But, and a lot of times, people don't get to talk about this topic as much as they want to in the craft that they're in. Um, you know, that's Chris Broussard said that a lot. He's like, yeah, I never get to talk about this. I'm always got to talk about basketball or something with LeBron or the Lakers or something else going on. I want to talk about this. Like, this is great. So, you know, that's how it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next question is what's your favorite interview in the book and why? And you don't have to say me, you don't have to, I release <laughs> you from saying me. <laughs> well, well, you know, the, the favorite, I mean, I guess the most impactful was all the family members. I mean, mm. those, those were also the most difficult to do. So, I mean, I'm interviewing the, the, the sisters of um, Sean Monterosa, who was, who was killed in Vallejo, and they're literally like breaking down during the interview. Same with the Tatiana Jefferson sisters. And I'm like, whoa, I mean, we could, I was like, we could stop. I don't want to make you cry. They're like, no, 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 just give me a minute. And let me get collect my thoughts and I'm gonna come back and I want to be able to say this and I want to be able to do it. so it's like therapeutic for them and they're trying to get it out those were like I can't tell you how they're I, after some of those interviews like I had to go and like decompress like I had to go lay down and you know something like that because it was they were so emotional but that but seeing those interviews that's what really pushed me to know that it's really important work um that I'm doing here yeah yeah um the next question is how were your experiences growing up different in Harlem versus Oklahoma? So in, in, in Harlem, you know, the, the police officers and you walk by them, you kind of look, it, it was it was a little bit different. In Tulsa, um, you know, I'm from a place in Tulsa and we had community policing back then. And so we had um, the Black Police Coalition and they all knew us. And we all knew them. Their children went to the schools. They went to our churches. They would put, they would do events that my mother would literally drop me off at on Saturday and just, when do you need me to pick him up type of a thing. So it was a different type of relationship. And then, and then they switched that. They went away from community policing. So community policing is one thing that a lot of the police officers say we need to get back to because you have an invested interest because it's your community. You know, I mean, I'll, if anybody remembers the show Lincoln Heights, I think it's called Lincoln Heights, they kind of depicted that of a policeman living in the community and how he cared for the community uh, is completely different, but that's, what, what, what I grew up remembering um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm, mm. Um, 
So here's a question. This is a question I know I always get a lot. So it'll be interesting to see what you say. Mm -hmm. Um, This attendee asks, have things gotten worse since since slash because of Trump? Or did he just give people the permission to speak their racism? That's, of course, the attendee's question. I think that's a great question. I mean, I think I think that it was always kind of dormant. It was just kind of waiting to bubble up. I think um, when President Obama went in office, it kind of emboldened a lot of, you know, because remember, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so I remember the 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 venom and the vitriol at President Obama being the person who is in the White House. So I think that kind of like ushered in a Trump to be able to come in. You know what I mean? Like, and and he he's he's he was a he played it right, you know. Like he's like you all are in. I saw it. I remember being in, in this uh, watching this, um, and he, he was doing a big rally in uh, or you maybe center. People don't know that, but that's the big maybe center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he was saying you're in the position that you're in because of them. And he gave all the people somebody to hate. And he was talking about Mexicans. And it was like all the hatred like went towards them. And then all the appreciation for him saying that went towards Trump. And like, you could see it happening. And it was just like, wow, like he really, like, I can't believe that really worked, you know, but it, but it worked like a charm. So he really used that in order to usher in, but it was already dormant. That's not like he created it. It was already there. He just he just tapped the right button. That's what I think. That's my yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, this is the next question is what was the motivation in choosing well, this is what was the motivation in choosing to include the poem? What do you see when you look at me? So that's my son. Um so my this son. This person stole my question, but it's fine. Oh, that's your question. <laughs> okay. Well, that was my son. So so with my son, you know, I was taking him to events and different speaking things since I, since he was like little. You know, it would start off and he would maybe like say a prayer before we do our event. He's a little cat, you know what I mean? Coming, then he starts doing his little poems. And then, you know, he starts writing more and more. So he wanted to write a poem for this book and he read the um, manuscript before it. And I got to say, I was, I was pretty impressed because he, he included some of the things, a lot of the topics that I covered in the book in his poem. And he put it together and I, you know, I was impressed with how it came out. So a lot of times when I would speak different places, uh, Malcolm would open up with a poem. So I just kind of kept that same thing with, with the book. Mm. Um, well, I, that was going to be my last question, but I, since we have a little bit more time, I have a couple questions because being a reporter, I always have questions on questions on questions. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> you have an afterword by Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. Talk a little bit about why you wanted to include him. Of course, his father was someone who was killed in his sleep um, by all the witnesses who were who were in that apartment. That's what they say. Mm-hmm. But talk a bit mm-hmm. about about why you wanted to include him and sort of what the history of Fred Hampton, which I think is was known by like maybe maybe known by folks like me whose parents really mm-hmm. made a point to teach them about all of the different um, characters and, and 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 figures in Black history, but wasn't really that known to so many others before the, uh, until the, the the movie that came out. So, so, I, so I grew up reading about Fred Hampton. So I knew I knew about him, but I watched um, the, the movie with my with my kids or everybody we watched it as a family. And it was and I remember afterwards, you know, there are certain parts that really, um, you know, were highlighted to them. So the one part and they wanted to look up more about it. again, remember, we homeschool so we could give them extra assignments to do, you know, on different stuff. So they, so so Malcolm was um, seeing the part where he brought the young patriots and the young lords and the Black Panthers all together. And then they were all fighting on one accord. He was like, so did he really do that? How did he do that? Like, I want to know more about that. So we started looking it up more. And it was really amazing. But that's really works into the allyship and the importance of allyship. And, you know, that was really something that was really what the, the government was really afraid of with Fred Hampton, because he was uniting people. I mean, the young patriots, they were, you know what I mean? I, they kept calling them the hillbillies, but they were like the ones that had the Confederate flags and the, everything. He united with them and the young lords were the Puerto Ricans, you know what I mean? And he right, you know, he united with them and they all stood together. And they were marching together and protesting together and saying that we want this, you know, for the police to stop doing this and the community and everything. And it was beautiful. Like that was like that. That's the unity and that's the strength and the power, you know, when you're unified. And that's the perfect person to have the forward for this book, because that's what I wanted to be able to do is I wanted to be able to create empathy. I want to be able to create, um, you know, um, of not just wanting to be an ally, but to be an accomplice, to be like you're, 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 you're in, 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 in them with it. Like, so you remember in Selma when they, they stood with the, um, the, the protesters before and the police stopped 
and they didn't attack them because they saw the white um, clergymen, the white protesters with them. That's literally what was happening um, during the, the, the summer of 20, uh, 2020. Um, it brought different protests around where white people were coming in, literally standing in front of the black protesters and they weren't attacking them. Like it was amazing to see. So we're watching everything in real time. And my daughter pointed it out. She's like, wait, that's like the Selma movie. Like they didn't attack them. And, and that's the part where it's, it's amazing. And it just shows where, you know, I have the, I don't know if, I don't want to think of this idealistic or anything, but I think that people can come together and be able to fight for a cause um, that is as noble as um, justice, actual justice in this country. You know, and even if it doesn't pertain to you because you don't have the same issues, you still feel the same empathy and the same, um, you know, you're, you're, you're as alert to it as if it did happen to your loved one. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And that's, yeah. that's why somebody like Fred Hampton is a perfect person, you know, for that photo forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question from an attendee here is, um, this is, re is this regarding sports? Um, they say, they say, do you think Colin Kaepernick should play professionally again? And what will be his legacy in this struggle? So I, I think Colin Kaepernick, you know, it, it's hard when you're looking at different quarterbacks and you're, you, you know, what Colin Kaepernick can do. And you're like, wow, he's, he's still not getting the call. Still not getting everything. But what he was able to do is to put on notice and to bring, you know, in my book, We Matter, I also interviewed um, Eric, Eric Reed, who was kneeling with Kaepernick the entire time. And, you know, one of the things that he was saying was that, you know, we kind of invaded the privacy of the sanctity of a lot of people in mainstream America that didn't want to talk about this or only talk about it on their terms. So, you know, with, the, with you know, NFL during a game was a time where people, some people wanted to just be clear from all of that. And he said, well, you know, for us, you know, we're, we're never clear of everything. As soon as I leave the game and I'm driving home, you know, he was talking about when he was stopped by the police driving home and, you know, he had to follow through all of the, you know, specifics of not m sudden movements because the police had their guns. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like, it, it, it's not, you can't get a break from it for us. And I think one of the things that Kaepernick did was to bring to um, national attention something that, a lot of people didn't want to talk about and kind of wanted to push aside and not deal with it at times or have the the luxury to only pick and choose when they want to talk about it. You know what I mean? So that's yeah. something that, and, and honestly, I think Kaepernick down the road, he's going to be talked about with so much reverence and so much, you know, th that it's interesting because if you talk to the older generation they, and they see all this, the way that Muhammad Ali is reverenced and they say, well, he wasn't, viewed like that when we were young, when he was in his heyday doing everything, I think that's how later on down the line, we're going to see Kaepernick talked about and revered for his bravery and his courage. And we're going to be like, wait a minute, that's not the way I was talking about him when he was here. So yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's what's going to happen. To be honest with well, you. Well, there's a great follow-up question to the Kaepernick question. And it's this, mm -hmm. it's what is slash was the responsibility of his peers in supporting him and have they met that responsibility? And if not, what are the consequences of not doing that? Well, you know, honestly, with a lot of the great men um, and the great people, sometimes you, they, they have to stand alone. And it's unfortunate, but a lot of times, I mean, you, you, you go through revisionists. It's, it's interesting, revisionist history. So we just uh, passed MLK weekend and, you know, people, you know, from the generations around there, you, you think that everybody supported Dr. King and everybody stood with him. And, everybody, and you look at it like, wait a minute, his approval rating was what when he passed, when he, when he, was, uh, when he was assassinated? Like it was low. And it's like, you know, sometimes you have to stand alone. And I think that Kaepernick, you know, is someone that had to stand alone, um, you know, unfortunately, but he but he made his point. Um, and that's how it is. That's how it is with a lot of people in, in history. You know, they have to stand alone. They don't have the support that they have that they would like to get from everybody. But that's that's why they're special. That's why they are who they are. You know, because they have the, the, the courage and, the, and they're willing to take that stand by themselves. Yeah. And these questions remind me of the first time I ever met you, which you, of course, will never remember because I was a student at Georgetown. You came to Georgetown University um, to talk about sort of uh, the role of athletes and sort of activism. And I wonder now what, what you think of that that role. That was way back in 2000. 
five when mm. I first met you again I was like a, a, a complete scared freshman never I don't I definitely didn't introduce myself um, right. <laughs> but I wonder what you what you make of, of sort of the role of athletes now and do you think you see sort of more people speaking up or do you watch the game and and, and watch this generation and think we generate this generation could be doing more well the thing is that I love about this generation is that you know they they number one they have social media so they have the ability to be able to speak out on their terms. So back then, you know, athletes had to go to a, a newspaper or, you know, a media person to be able to convince them to do a story on them. I mean, I had that myself when I was with the Wizards and I wanted to speak out against the war in Iraq and the Washington Post and the Washington Times was like, no, we can't do that. And I was like, really? Like you literally follow me around, follow us all around to get a story about anything. But now that I have something meaningful, you don't want to run it. But now with social media, they don't have to, they can bypass all of that. And I just think there's like, could you imagine if like Muhammad Ali had a Twitter account? Like oh it would have been crazy. I know, right? <laughs> but but I love the way that young people now are using their, their voice and using their platforms to be able to speak out on different things. And they're doing it in their way. And sometimes their way doesn't look like our way that we did it. But I think it's great. Like I, you know, everything that they're doing. I love the unity. I love when, you know, the fearlessness and the ability to be able to come out and, you know, speak about something the way that LeBron is using his platform and then all the other players, you know, they, they, they're in, emboldened and, and empowered by the fact that LeBron, um, who is the top player, is so willing to use his voice. So, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, I think it's great. I think they're doing a great job. Yeah. Um, and we have only about four minutes left. So I'm going to ask you something sort of forward thinking. Um, it's okay. a two part question. The first is obviously you just finished this book. It's an amazing book. Um, mm -hmm. What what do you make of sort of your next steps? Like what do you have ideas after you've researched and written this book that you want to already start on projects or also sort of what's next for this book? Do you, where can people find it? What, what should they be doing sort of to try to support and get this book? Well, I, I, I love, you know, with this port, I'm, I'm going to put together a whole college tour. I really liked, you know, what I did with We Matter was was speaking at different universities. Like what you said, when you, when you met me at, at Georgetown. I love doing that and engaging with And it, can, you know, it really students. does stick with students because I remember, like, literally, I didn't know anything about basketball. I know it's embarrassing. <laughs> My husband would, like, die that I'm right. saying this publicly. But I went to Georgetown with, like, not a knowledge of basketball. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is, a, and, and for me, it was the, conver what brought me to that conversation was because I was so interested in, in the meshing of athlete, of of an athlete in activism and I was like, way more yeah. interested in the activism part but because right. I started thinking oh these are people who have this incredible sort of platform and here's someone who wants to talk about this topic right right and it resonates so that's really what I want to keep doing you know now with you know navigating through COVID you have to try to figure out how to do it virtually you know hopefully we get back but that's really where I, I, I love having those discussions and then moving forward you know I'm always keep writing there's so much to write about you know and you're there's so much to get get off your chest and to write and explore different ways. I might do a children's book and just do something specific for children, you know. So I, I don't know. I have a lot of ideas, but it's definitely a blessing to to be able to this this book is being received really well, and people are you know um, you know asking questions and encouraged and you know uh, stimulating thoughts about it and having opinions and fun. That's what that's what it's supposed to do. So I'm, I'm happy with that part. That's awesome. Well, I would definitely want to see maybe more of your son's poetry, maybe some thoughts from baby Sierra and Imani, as well as maybe your wife. So I think there are all sorts of maybe family projects that you could do. So definitely, at least sounding definitely. like all these family times that you're having. So definitely. it sounds like a great um, future ahead. So I'm going to turn it back over to the people at Politics and Pros. Take it away. Brad, I think it's who's going to go up next. Yeah, great moderating, Yamish. And um, and and, and uh, Etan, there's so much uh, in this book, uh, so many great informed voices speaking to the vital issues of, of race and, and justice. You know, you, you really have a knack again for gathering and combining uh, interviews like this and, and the addition of your own voice and experiences give the book such, such an engaging personal dimension as well. To everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing copies of, of release brutality and white supremacy. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read.